Those of you who are sitting in the back, we are welcome to sit in the front. There's lots of room, so feel free. Um, welcome everyone to uh, CSIS. My name is Ed Chow, and I'm with the Energy and National uh, Security Program here uh, at the center. Uh, I want to uh, give a special welcome to an old friend, uh, Dr. Tatiana Mitrova, who is just about the best Russian oil and gas analysts that I can think of. Uh, we at CSIS have been working together with Tatiana on a report on the political economic outlook for Russian oil and gas sector that we hope will come out uh, sometime uh, towards the beginning of next year. Uh, and so we, we were going over uh, the, the, the drafts of the report uh, while she's here and thought it would be a great opportunity to uh, talk to all of you about the initial findings uh, from the report and listen to your comments and, and questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tatiana. Okay, thank you very much, Ed, for this uh, introduction. Really very pleasant to be here. and. Uh, I'll try to do my best to explain what's going on. Uh, I cannot swear that I understand myself completely, all this stuff, but uh, at least uh, uh, I'll try to give some light uh, in this very, very complicated and uh, difficult story. So, uh, first of all, uh, I will start with the uh, status quo, where Russian oil and gas industry find it, uh, finds itself today, and definitely it's an absolutely new reality. It's enough just to look at these two graph, uh, graphs uh, describing Russian economy uh, with a negative GDP growth, with a huge inflation and rubble devaluation, to understand that a lot has changed during the last two years. But actually, uh, it's not just the macroeconomic decline. It's a huge set of different factors uh, which have driven oil and gas industry and the whole Russian economy in a completely new, very unfavorable environment, which can be best characterized by this phrase, perfect storm. So if one would like to imagine the most catastrophic uh, scenario, the most negative coincidence of all possible negative factors, I think uh, it will be even out of discussion, even though. So uh, what do we have? We have a number of the global challenges, which are actually facing all oil and gas producers, so it's the global economic slowdown and stagnant demand both in the European market, which is the core market for Russia, uh, but also slowing down uh, growth of demand in Asia, which is also quite negative. Uh, we see this increasing global supply, and it's something new. There were no uh, actually new suppliers coming to the global market uh, for the last 25 years. And now suddenly there is a quite long list of the new players coming to the market. Uh, and uh, this oversupply has just started, but there is Iran, Iraq, uh, East Africa, Australia, Brazil also queuing in this line. And they are preparing to deliver new volumes of hydrocarbons in a medium term already. Uh, and U.S., of course, all this uh, shale revolution story and U.S. turning from net importer to exporter, both of oil and LNG, uh, that's definitely changing the whole, let's say, global world order. So uh, obviously, low price environment is playing an extremely unfavorable role for the Russian state, which is, I mean, the federal budget is 47% dependent on revenues, uh, on taxes, uh, uh, on oil taxes. So uh, such a significant oil price decline as we observed during the last year, uh, it's of course a very painful story, first of all, for the state, not even so much for the companies, but for the uh, for the state. And then on top of that, we have all this story with the sanctions, which I, I will uh, uh, speak more about that uh, a little bit later. But uh, altogether, this is creating very uh, challenging picture of the external environment. But then. We have also some domestic <laughs> stories which uh, are developing in quite a negative way, uh, which are further uh, aggravating the situation. So 
Uh, first of all, this economic slowdown, which I have illustrated at the previous slide, um, it's very important to understand that it's not driven by the low oil prices or by the sanctions. Actually, it started uh, quite long before that, in 2012, 2013, when oil prices were above $100 per barrel and when there were no sanctions under discussion and everything was fine, but all these accumulated structural problems and all this lack of reforms uh, and all this lack of modernization and real sector for development, uh, they really accumulated and started to slow down economic growth, even in quite favorable in external environment. So uh, these uh, structural problems, they are still not solved, and it looks like uh, they are not being uh, addressed uh, right now, uh, which means that the economy uh, is uh, deep in stagnation, and even for the next years, uh, when uh, some recovery of GDP growth rates are expected is expected uh, still uh, there are no drivers visible for any significant growth so okay stagnant economy and growing economy these are two completely different economies and first of all in terms of uh, implications for the domestic energy demand so uh, after several years of the first decade of this century of booming demand for domestic demand for electricity for oil products for gas Actually, it has flattened and it's not growing, which means a completely different domestic energy demand. Uh, there is no need for new power plants construction. There is no need actually for additional supplies of petroleum products or gas to the domestic market because there is no demand domestically. The industry is not developing and the commercial sector is not developing at all. So for, for quite a long-term perspective, at least for the next 10 years, we do not see any visible growth in the domestic fuel demand. It is important change. And then, on top of that, we have this situation with the frozen regulated domestic prices. Uh, when this crisis, when this economic slowdown started, it was quite a typical decision of the government uh, to freeze the prices in order to avoid uh, social unrest, in order to support national industry uh, to be still more or less competitive on the external markets. So uh, the decision was made and the gas and electricity fr prices are frozen at the level of inflation. And it is already understandable that it is more or less clearly articulated in the new energy strategy uh, that regulated prices will remain for a long-term perspective. It's not just a temporary decision for a couple of years. So until 2030, maybe even 2035, we will not get liberalized pricing in these markets, which means for the energy companies uh, that domestic market with stagnant demand frozen low regulated prices is absolutely non-attractive. So uh, there was um, such a thought that probably if the external environment is not favorable, there could be some relief provided by the domestic market growth, but it doesn't. So domestic market cannot actually help here despite its huge capacity and its huge volume, but it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to provide any support for the uh, oil and gas company, for the oil and gas industry. And then we have some very old inherited issues uh, which are very, very long on the table, but they, uh, they are still not solved. I mean, this depletion of the Soviet legacy field and the need to uh, go for the new frontiers, the need to attract new, inv uh, new investments, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, need to create a more favorable environment for investments, first of all, through the tax reform in the oil industry, which is under discussion for more than a decade, but still not solved. And of course, uh, we have huge problems in addressing uh, in uh, access to financing, which is uh, first of all explained by the lower oil prices and then by the sanctions. So uh, we have these cuts of investment programs and uh, last but not least, the problem which is like waiting uh, for 
many years to be addressed, but still nothing is changing. This institutional, the whole institutional framework of the energy sector, which is really extremely inefficient, and these inefficiencies are only increasing, uh, but uh, there are no attempts to go for any uh, significant market reforms to really introduce more efficient environment. So, uh, to a certain extent, the problems which Russian oil and gas sector is facing is, are just explained by this incredible inefficiency. So, even if you uh, look at the costs of pipeline construction, field development, whatever you take, uh, power plant construction in Russia and make a benchmark comparison with the international uh, similar projects, you will see that the costs are uh, like two times higher, three times higher sometimes. Dollar costs, not in rubles. So uh, these uh, incredible inefficiency is definitely a very negative factor. So altogether, this is creating a new environment and uh, First of all, uh, in terms of GDP, as a, it's just an illustration to the previous slide showing how much the expectation have changed. So here you see actually uh, the uh, previous uh, target, let's say optimistic forecast of the energy strategy, which was uh, approved in 2009. And you can see how step by step these expectations were reviewed downwards and now it is an official conservative scenario, which means that it's rather optimistic. <laughs> so it's just flattering. So it means that the economy, which during the last 20 years was always growing, is, uh, is, it is tr moving to this absolutely different path of being stagnant. <laughs> And it's not very clear how sustainable it is and how exactly it's going to function. But then we have also some other implications of this global and domestic environment. And first of all, some very important implications of the low oil prices, which are definitely very, very painful factor for Russia, similarly to the OPEC members and other important hydrocarbon producers. So uh, I've mentioned already stagnant domestic demand, uh, which is important, which means that uh, less uh, production uh, is demanded. But then uh, another very important part is that budget deficit is an inevitable with such low oil prices. For this year, it's approximately 4.6%. Uh, uh, it's difficult to say what will be next, but we understand that when oil prices uh, go down to $40 per barrel, uh, it's really very challenging uh, for the budget. And it is obviously creating huge desire uh, uh, for the authorities uh, to, uh, to try to find new sources of revenues. And where do they look? Obviously at this uh, uh, old milch cow, which is oil and gas sector. So uh, it's just inevitable that taxes in the oil and gas industry will increase because there are no other sectors in the economy where you could gain any additional revenues. There are some discussions to introduce tax export taxes for steel producers, for coal production, which does not have any export duty, uh, but still, uh, it's all very uh, doubtful, while oil and gas, here they are, you don't need uh, anything else. Uh, so the pressure on the companies will increase, and it, it has already started, I will speak a little bit about it later, which means that with low oil prices, increasing financial pressure, taxation pressure from the government, the companies have no other choice rather than to reduce their investment programs, postpone some of the uh, most challenging and expensive projects. And that's exactly what has started already. So they are announcing, sometimes like blackmailing the government, saying if you will introduce new taxes, we will reduce production and we will postpone these or that 
field. Uh, but generally, it's it's uh, inevitable to a certain extent because, uh, of course, uh, for example, Arctic offshore or uh, some uh, unconventional field development, which were which was more or less justified at $100 per barrel, doesn't fly at $50 per barrel. So there is also commercial logic that the production should be reduced in such oversupplied global market. Um, so we see already how it is uh, developing. And another implication, which is also quite a contradictory outcome of lower oil prices is this uh, lower oil prices and lower demand growth. Uh, is this increasing reorientation of the Russian oil and gas sector towards uh, the Asian markets? Because uh, if you look at Europe, which used to be the main target market for Russian oil and gas supplies, since 2006, European liquid consumption and uh, gas consumption is only declining. So it's absolutely logical, even if we forget all the geopolitical considerations, but just looking at the market analysis, of course you would prefer to focus on the growing market, uh, which is still Asia. So uh, this uh, pivot to Asia, it has started in 2008, 2009, not in 2014, definitely, uh, uh, much earlier. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's extremely successful, but it is still, it's moving on step by step, uh, though it has one peculiar Peculiarity, it's mainly China oriented. So it's not the whole Asia, it's mainly China. And then we have, of course, this another very important external factor, which are sanctions. Uh, we have financial sanctions, we have these uh, technological sanctions. I would say, uh, I always uh, have this, get this question whether our sanctions are working or not. And it's very difficult to answer because the answer is yes and no. So yes, they are working to a certain extent, especially financial sanctions. If we are uh, looking at... Uh, at uh, the access of the Russian companies to the international financial markets, yes, definitely it was undermined. And what is most important, it was not undermined just for Rosneft, Novatek, and Gazprom Neft. It was undermined for all Russian companies, not just only energy companies, but for energy companies in particular. And you know what is the most negative, uh, to my mind, uh, result uh, of this is that these are private companies which are suffering most, not state-controlled companies which were the main target of these sanctions, because the state will always help them and find the ways uh, how to support them. But private companies, they do not have this uh, uh, state support, uh, and they, they will have to reduce their investments much uh, faster, much uh, uh, to a large extent than the state-controlled companies. Uh, and uh, there were some expectations uh, uh, in, in 2014 when the sanctions were introduced that uh, there will be some relief coming from the Asian financial institutions that they would be able to provide. China has tremendous uh, reserve, financial reserves, but uh, what was a very unpleasant uh, surprise uh, during the last year and a half was that Asian uh, banks uh, and companies are very cautious and they prefer not to get engaged in any operations that could uh, irritate the US. Uh, they prefer, n they don't want to take this risk. So normally uh, there was uh, like expectation that, well, China is quite active in Iran, quite, quite active everywhere, so they are like ignoring the sanctions. But the reality has shown that no, they are not. They are cautious, they prefer to avoid this risk. And therefore for the Russian companies, instead of three to 4% interest rate, which they were enjoying like three, four, five years ago, now it's 13 to 14% which kills most of the projects, even without uh, low oil prices. It is already a huge challenge. So uh, financial sanctions, yes, they work. And what is most, the most nasty thing about them, that 
at the moment it's not visible so strongly so everybody knows about Rosneft's problems with re repaying debts and each quarter when they have to repay it like the whole market is looking praying that they will not drop the rubble or something like that uh, just recently uh, it was no it was not announced explicitly but it became uh, clear that uh, most likely they have received this uh, long-awaited uh, prepayment from CNPC, so which they agreed uh, in last September. Uh, they were waiting for a year. Finally, according to their financial reporting, from some places they received trillion rubles, so I, I do not have any other idea rather than <laughs> CNPC providing this money. Uh, but uh, so, so that's a huge relief for Rosneft, definitely, and it's really uh, changing the situation. It's giving at least one or two years for them of more or less uh, quiet uh, and sustainable life. But at the same time, all the other companies which do not have uh, such a deal with China, uh, they are actually now eating the resources which they have accumulated during the previous rich years. So they have, uh, they have uh, enough uh, resources to survive for a year or two uh, to sustain their investment prog uh, programs, just investing their own capital, which is not like a sustainable model in the global market. So you can do it for a year or two, but then the question is how long uh, you can sustain this model. So. Uh, Financial sanctions most likely will become really visible and really painful, uh, not immediately, with, uh, they will be slightly postponed, uh, but uh, if Russia doesn't find any really um, system solution how to access international financial market, that is going to be a big problem. And uh, with technological sanctions, the situation is different. So uh, I would say they are not working, uh, they are not uh, having any visible effect because they are targeted at the Arctic offshore and at the uh, shale oil, uh, which uh, constitute a uh, like negligible fraction of the total Russian oil output at the moment. Uh, they were like a long-term um, uh, projects uh, which were expected to start their production post-2025 and which would never actually start production at $40 per barrel environment. So uh, they are not happening, these projects are postponed or terminated, but that's not a big deal for the current oil output. It's not affecting the current oil operations and I will show later on that in fact Russian oil production is increasing. So despite all these sanctions and low oil prices, uh, Russian oil companies, they are, in fact, it's one or two percent, that's not a big deal as well, but still it shows that uh, the industry has a very good uh, resilience, uh, it's, it has a lot of reserve capacity, so uh, for the time being there are no really serious threats for the current operations. Of course, that will have a postponed effect if we start talking about 2025, 2030, when to sustain Russian production, it was assumed that we will go for Arctic, we will go for Bajanefrog. If the sanctions will still be there, then it will be problematic. Uh, but uh, it's not so critical at the moment. At the same time, it wouldn't be true if I would say that technological sanctions are not working at all. They are, but in a very strange way. So I think Yuzhna Kirinska is the best illustration for that. Uh, it is the project uh, which, uh, which didn't feel actually any threats for a year unless uh, they, uh, until the uh, explanations and clarifications and renderings from the US came that Sakhalin is Arctic, and Yuzhna Kirinska gas field is in fact oil field, and therefore it's under sanctions, and therefore actually Shell cannot participate in its, product, in its development. So uh, 
this was a very strong message uh, showing that actually even the current sanctions without any additional uh, points being added to this list at a if with the certain clarifications of the gray zones uh, can be extremely painful because this was, uh, this Yuzhnikirinsky case uh, means in fact that Sakhalin 2 expansion is very strongly threatened. So the flagship uh, LNG project. Uh, uh, so uh, you see that uh, these sanctions, they are creating a lot of nervousness, a lot of negative expectations and uncertainty. So they are not acting right now, they are not affecting the current production, but they are affecting the feelings and expectations of the market players. Uh, they are affecting equipment suppliers, as I mentioned, Chinese, Koreans, they are now very, very cautious in all these negotiations, or they are asking for very high premium for the risk, which is also understandable. Uh, frankly speaking, so far, uh, Russia doesn't suffer from the lack of any particular equipment because all the companies, uh, especially European companies, find many ways how to get this authorization and finally to uh, deliver uh, these details or this equipment. So it's more the matter of time and expenditures rather than complete unavailability of the certain equipment. But everybody is realizing how fragile it is and how easily it could be uh, threatened or stopped. So uh, the whole feeling is uh, rather negative and in this respect uh, the sanctions, uh, technological sanctions are working. So what Russia is doing in addressing this threat, of course uh, the huge uh, state-driven uh, um, program of investment uh, of um, import replacement was initiated uh, actually in all spheres of the energy industry, not just oil and gas, but also the power sector and so on, uh, which is quite understandable. Um, it's still not clear whether it will be able to deliver any uh, significant results earlier than in seven to ten years, just a normal investment cycle. So if you are developing, for example, the plant which will produce uh, liquefaction equipment or uh, equipment for drilling and fracturing, you cannot make it faster, especially if you are starting from, from the scratch. So. Uh, there are some spheres where this dependence on the imported equipment is very high, like offshore or horizontal drilling uh, services, services that's a special uh, disaster. Uh, and it's not just about the drilling and fracking itself. That's something that Russian oil companies are doing for the last like, 40 years, so they know how to do it. But what they don't know and what they don't have are these IT technologies with which the Western companies and especially service companies have accumulated with all these knowledge databases uh, providing the data for hundreds, thousands frackings done all over the world. And this is to be developed. You cannot just create it overnight. That's a huge experience and know-how which is missing. Uh, so uh, there, are, uh, there are threats, there are some partial solutions. Uh, Asian equipment suppliers were regarded as an important part of this solution, but I wouldn't say that at the moment uh, all these attempts were very successful. So of course there is a lot of Chinese equipment, especially in the drilling, in the traditional uh, technologies, but with the new technologies like liquefaction or, for example, uh, these uh, Arctic offshore platforms. Uh, Chinese, they have uh, some um, um, experimental technologies, but I mean, making such an experiment in Russian Arctic seems to be a little bit too risky. So, but if there will be no other choice, uh, I think they will be implemented. But again, looking at how the negotiations are proceeding, I wouldn't say that it's that easy. So even uh, in this case, uh, uh, negotiating with China uh, is going in a quite difficult way. So uh, uh, again, it is at the moment quite sustainable 
but with huge uncertainties and risks. So if we are looking at the baseline scenario, there is no significant effect on the Russian oil and gas production. But if we assume that uh, any additional restrictions will be implemented or any additional clarifications would be given, that could really have very strong uh, effect. And uh, just a few words about uh, the domestic um, factors affecting uh, the oil and gas uh, sector. And first of all, the institutional framework and the whole industrial dynamics. So uh, if you look at the oil sector structure, uh, it is visible that uh, during the last decade it has changed dramatically. And again, it happened before oil price collapse, before sanctions. That was just the logics uh, how authorities uh, saw uh, the, the, the role of the uh, oil sector in the whole Russian economy. And you see these uh, lines uh, showing the share of state-controlled companies in the oil output. So it used to be 4% uh, of total uh, oil output in 2003. In 2013, it was already 50%. Now with Bashneft, it's already 57%. So the trend is quite clear towards more centralization and towards higher role of the state-controlled companies. Uh, and as I mentioned, because of the lower oil prices and much more because of the financial sanctions, it looks that this trend will only increase because of the private companies, they do not have any support or any uh, last resort uh, which will help them to overcome these financial constraints. While state-controlled companies, they still have some support and they can count like uh, on the uh, reserve funds, on the support from Sberbank, VTB and other state banks. So there will be uh, uh, some hope for them at least. Uh, another important part of the oil uh, institutional environment um, is the taxation. And it is the issue which has been under discussion for a very long period of time. And now it's difficult to find any person in the Russian establishment which would disagree that there is a need for tax reform, but <laughs> there is no tax reform uh, in this respect. So. Uh, this volume-based taxation, which is currently uh, working, uh, it's definitely not creating any incentives for the companies to uh, invest in the uh, unconventional oil or difficult fields or enhanced oil recovery. It's good only for cheap uh, Soviet legacy operational fields. Uh, for the rest, they will not invest simply. Uh, and. Uh, there, there is a very long discussion about different ways how to proceed to the profit-based taxation which would create such incentives. Uh, but at the same time, there is a very hot discussion between the financial ministry and the energy ministry. So energy ministry is promoting this idea, while financial ministry, which is always preoccupied by the uh, volumes of budget revenues, uh, is strongly opposing, claiming to the experience of 1990s when the companies, the oil companies were really very good in uh, showing very high costs and zero profits or just negative profits. So. Uh, uh, the state is really uh, frightened by this threat uh, of a sudden drop in the budget revenues, so this threat that they will not be able to administrate this profit-based taxation. And uh, this discussion was ongoing during the last two, three years in a very you know, hot way. Uh, and um, it looks like it, it finally ended up with the failure of the energy ministry uh, during the last uh, Presidential Energy Commission, the end of October. Uh, the final word by Mr. Putin was that you need to work it through once again. At the moment, it's not applicable, it's not well justified. And even the proposal of the Energy Ministry, at least to have an experiment. Uh, of this uh, profit-based taxation for several fields, not for everything, but just for few fields for several companies, uh, it looks uh, that it will be postponed. So the tax
tax reform, which is really already urgent because the share of Soviet legacy field production is definitely declining each year. Uh, it's postponed once again until 2017 or maybe later, so who knows. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, the so-called tax maneuver is introduced, which is a very strange animal, which is actually the result of all these negotiations in the framework of the Eurasian Energy Union uh, about synchronization of the taxes. Uh, so uh, uh, in order to keep uh, these countries like Belarus, Kazakhstan in, in, this, in its sphere of influence uh, and to keep this uh, regional cooperation organization developing, uh, Russia agreed to uh, synchronize these taxes and as a result it has to reduce its export duties and increase instead upstream taxes, mineral extraction tax, just to make it similar for all the members of the union. So of course as you can imagine for the oil industry it's absolutely an attractive uh, exercise. So in the time when you see oil price drops and such dramatic changes in the global market, you suddenly start changing the whole taxation system, which is not uh, nice uh, anyway. But then if you look at how exactly it was calculated, how exactly it was done, and most importantly, how finally the government was uh, like told to introduce a special windfall tax uh, because the oil companies are now suddenly enjoying a higher profits as a result of rubble devaluation. So you can imagine that for the companies it became a complete disaster. It's impossible to plan any investments when the future, your future taxation system for the next year, not after 10 years, but even for the next year, is changing every three months. So definitely uh, that has created a lot of uh, um, uh, complaints and uh, unhappiness uh, from the oil sector. Uh, even uh, Mr. Sechin uh, was uh, disputing this issue with President, trying to argue that uh, this tax maneuver is not a good idea. Uh, but anyway, it is approved already. These taxes are approved already. <clears throat> this freeze of the uh, export uh, duty reduction, that's how this windfall tax uh, will be collected. It is approved for the next year, and most likely it will be approved for 2017. Which means that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the uh, Russian oil companies are already facing increasing financial pressure and increasing taxation pressure right now. And uh, similarly to that, in the gas industry, uh, mineral extraction tax was uh, increased for Gazprom. Most likely it will be increased also for the independents later on. So uh, oil sector starts to pay more uh, right now. And uh, with the gas sector, if we look at the institutional framework, it's quite frequently uh, mentioned now that it's becoming more dynamic, more competitive. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, there is a severe competition between Gazprom, Rosneft, and Novatec, uh, but still it is under very strong state control. And, uh, you know, if you look exactly at how this competition is taking place, it's better characterized by regional monopolies were, uh, type rather than a competitive market or oligopoly uh, to a certain extent. So still uh, it's very far away from a proper functioning market. Uh, but. Uh, what is really important that, again, all these, uh, like with the t uh, oil tax reform, uh, all these unfavorable external events and all these weak uh, domestic economy, uh, they are actually freezing the current state of art. Uh, all the discussions which Rosneft is trying to promote concerning Gazprom reform, Gazprom unbundling, liberalizing export access and so on, uh, they were actually refused by the government and by the presidential administration. They were not even uh, taken to the agenda of the presidential commission, which was a very important sign that the government doesn't want to discuss this issue at the moment. So uh, most likely uh, the situation will remain uh, as it is. 
uh, there will be probably some uh, minor adjustments and changes like providing access to the underground storages for the independence or making transportation tariff a little bit more transparent there than it is or maybe even providing Rosneft third-party access to the power of Siberia or something like that so there could be I wouldn't say that there will be no changes but the real change which uh, people are talking about when they mentioned gas market reform so just unbundling Gazprom and creating uh, spot uh, trade and spot pricing and liberalizing gas export it doesn't look likely for that simple reason first of all that the state needs some company like Gazprom uh, to uh, actually uh, to be uh, a political tool domestically and abroad because otherwise uh, how can you force private uh, commercial companies to cross-subsidize domestic consumers and external consumers, industry and population, Kaliningrad and Moscow, Chechnya and Sverdlovsk. So there are so many social obligations which Gazprom is carrying, social obligations, geopolitical obligations, like all these uh, politically driven projects which are commercially absolutely not uh, uh, attractive. and. Uh, all this gasification, which is a loss maker. So there are so many issues which the gov for which the government is using gas industry that either it has to refuse from utilizing gas in this role or it needs something like Gazprom. So therefore, I would expect that the status quo will remain with potential some losses from Gazprom side because Rosneft is very keen to get at least a piece of this pie. And Rosneft, together with Novatek, are actually now in a desperate position because domestic market where they grew, where they made their gas business, uh, is no longer attractive. As I mentioned, uh, demand is not increasing. They've already cherry-picked all, all the best clients, so they do not have any room for expansion. And the prices are frozen. And actually, if you look at the price dynamics in dollar term, they dropped, they dropped to the level of 2008. Uh, so it's not a profitable, it's not an interesting market any longer. So of course, the major stakes are at reaching the export market. So that's what Rosneft and Novatek are dreaming about. But at the same time, it's very difficult to imagine that they will be allowed to have their own independent uh, gas export policy, assuming that gas is such an important tool of the whole external policy for Russia. So there is a strong contradiction. And as I said, if you have some contradiction, most likely the solution will be again postponed. Um, so summing up, what do we have today in the Russian oil and gas industry? We have, amazingly, this oil production growth, 1-2%, but still it's growing. We have declining exports, and you see that they are declining for already quite a long period of time, with European supplies um, declining much faster and Asian supplies replacing part of that. And this is the trend which is fixed in all the official documents. It's not something new. That's how it is uh, expected to be. And we have gas production which each year drops further and further because there are no markets nor domestically nor in former Soviet Union nor in Europe nor in Asia because of lack of any infrastructure at the moment. So uh, gas production is really strongly constrained by the markets. And gas exports, as you see, they are fluctuating mainly due to the weather and uh, Gazprom's pricing. Uh, but still, they did not recover to the pre-crisis levels. And uh, uh, there is no visible relief uh, in, in the next several years. So that's the picture, and the major, uh, the most interesting question is how it will further develop, what are the scenarios of the Russian uh, production and oil and gas production and exports. So for oil production, uh, it definitely depends very strongly on the external uh, situation with the oil prices. And if we assume no changes in taxation and no sanctions, uh, modifications or expansions, just 
status quo in terms of sanctions, uh, then these are the production scenario which we've produced. Uh, so these are the results of modeling. And you see that uh, with the current prices, there is some slight decline, but frankly speaking, 20 million tons per annum, that's not such a big deal. That's, that's unpleasant. That's something that the energy ministry prefer not to face because they are responsible for the, uh, for the quantity of oil produced. But still, it's not changing dramatically the whole balance, and uh, that's not a problem. But if the oil prices would remain, as I've shown here, at very low level of 30 to 40 dollars per barrel then it's already creating a huge problem uh, because here you see a much stronger decline of like 50 million tons and all these volumes would be sold at much lower price than here so that means that the state budget is really facing uh, significant problems and that would mean that the companies here do not have uh, money for further investments. So you see that the speed of this decline uh, is much faster. That's a catastrophic scenario, not catastrophic, but dramatic probably scenario. And that could um, finally end up with uh, uh, some significant changes in the regulation, in the upstream access, for example, for the foreign companies, uh, not for the Western majors, I assume, but for the uh, Chinese, Indian companies, so for the new investors, let's put it this way, maybe partial privatization because both companies, uh, state-controlled companies and the government will need money badly. So this is the scenario when some dramatic change could occur and in terms of gas industry it's not that dependent on the oil prices it's much much more dependent on the market conjuncture especially on what is happening with the Asian demand because with the European demand there are no hopes that it will recover with Asian demand there are still some hopes that probably it will grow or not uh, but you see uh, that if it's not growing and if uh, at the same time the new competitors are coming to the market as fast as they plan, so there are no delays in the US LNG, in Australian LNG, and uh, so on, uh, then uh, actually that could mean just flat gas production in Russia for the next decade. It doesn't look as dramatic as here. It's not decline, but believe me, it's a drama because the initial expectations in the general scheme of the Russian gas industry development for this period of time was above 900 BCM per annum production. So it's far, far below the volumes that were projected, that were expected, for which the gas companies were preparing. And what is most uh, important is the fact that currently there is already huge oversupply in the market domestically. Uh, Gazprom is holding its production uh, much below the capacity. Rosneft and Novatek uh, are actually postponing the fields which are already prepared. So this whole gas bubble, it's about 150 billion cubic meters. So the gas which could be produced next year if there is a demand, but there is no demand. So actually everybody has overinvested. Gazprom has overinvested. Just the decision on Bovanenko was uh, taken in uh, 2008, like two months before the oil price dropped for the first time. So, and before it became clear that European gas demand is in a very bad shape. So, uh, Rosneft was very aggressively investing in gas business and Novatech as well. So, they've already investments, uh, made these investments, they are sunk. And therefore, I mean, Supporting this production is not a problem, but how to increase it if you don't have export markets, that's that's really a huge challenge for the Russian gas industry. And you can imagine that, again, if the companies are just sustaining the current volumes of production, the competition will become even more tough than it is now. Even now, it is very tough, believe me. So if you follow it, it's best uh, uh, detective story, how they are fighting for each particular customer, how Rosneft and Novatek are lobbying for Gazprom and bundling. So it's a fascinating story, really. Uh, but still, um, uh, the most interesting uh, is further to come. 
And what about exports? So, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, with the oil exports, it looks to be like prolongation of the trend which I have shown already. So, declining volumes, and as I said, it's inevitable, uh, increasing uh, share of the Asia-oriented exports, uh, though you see this incremental growth is uh, lower than the one we have already observed during the last five years declining share of the European market and CIS market, obviously. Uh, I would split it into two phases, so phase one uh, before 2018-2020 and phase two afterwards. Uh, this period when actually no significant expansion of the Asia-oriented capacities is physically possible, it will be a period of very severe competition in Europe. And I think we've started already to see it uh, with all these um, con conflict points with uh, Saudi Arabia, which is trying to jump in into the Russian refinery, uh, into the Russia supplied refineries, and trying uh, to again uh, get the best clients. Uh, and it is uh, yet uh, the period when Iran didn't show at the market. So actually it was Russia which has overtaken Iranian uh, share in European market when the sanctions were introduced on Iran. Uh, and now Saudi Arabia is trying to establish itself in this market, but then Iran at a certain point will come back and try to restore its positions. So uh, price dampening here, which Saudi Arabia started already to implement, is becoming inevitable. And as the Russian companies actually, they do not have any other opportunities how to redirect this oil and where to put it. They cannot send it eastwards because there are no capacities available for that. Uh, it is most likely a period of price war in Europe. Yeah, uh, which is bad news. And uh, the main target will be just to adjust and to protect market share. Later on, when the ESPO uh, expansion will occur, probably oh, it's under, under development, uh, and uh, some additional contracts most likely will be signed uh, with the Asian buyers. Uh, this pressure will lower a little bit. And also the, this bubble on the global market will probably partially disappear, hopefully. A uh, very similar situation with gas. It's just amazing. Uh, so you see uh, uh, the first five years, uh, there is actually no diversification to the east. Again, just for the physical reasons. It takes five years to build the pipeline. It takes another five years to bring it to the full capacity. So before 2025, we cannot expect any serious increase in uh, east-oriented gas supplies. So it will be still Europe, but in Europe it is exactly the period when uh, all these new suppliers uh, will come to the market. It, it is going to be, starting from the next year already, it's going to be a period of very strong competition with LNG, growing competition with LNG. And so uh, the main task will be just to adapt, just to protect market share, uh, which Again, as with uh, uh, oil, Russia has very good preconditions for that because by the end of the day, its costs are very low, both for gas and for oil, it can compete. The other thing is that it doesn't want to uh, because uh, price war means uh, huge uh, losses in revenues. Yeah? But if there will be no other way uh, to uh, protect uh, export volumes, then it will have to go for that. And later on, uh, by 2025, you see that there is uh, this expansion. Uh, it's actually power of Siberia uh, coming on stream. Uh, but still, if you compare these figures, these export figures, with the uh, previous projections, which were, for example, in the previous energy strategy in 2009, it was about 470 BCM exports. You can see that's a huge revision downwards. That's just tremendous revision. And, and um, it's not visible how else Russia could deal with it. What could be the outlets for this gas? Where could it send this gas? Uh, 
because of the global situation, the markets do not demand additional gas uh, from us. So at the same time, uh, just to finish the gas story, it's not that gloomy in Europe because Gazprom managed to uh, develop very good uh, portfolio, uh, trouble-proof portfolio of long-term contracts. And you see that actually even at minimal take or pay uh, volumes, it is providing nearly the same volumes as currently. Uh, until 2022, 2025, and if you sell on top of that, like 20 to 30 BCM at the spot market, here you are. So sustaining current export volumes to Europe does not look like a big problem, but increasing them, no hope, actually. Uh, and uh, frequent, another frequently asked question is about pipelines. So what will happen with the Russian pipeline strategy in Europe? And here again, I can answer only I wish I knew. So uh, that's a very um, opportunistic strategy uh, because the environment is so unclear and there is such a huge political uh, factor playing in Turkish Stream, in North Stream 2, uh, actually as it was in South Stream, that it's really very difficult to uh, predict how exactly it will play out. And so the strategy is like improvise try to create as much options as possible, try to promote all of them, to move all of them, hoping that at least one of them will work at the end of the day. But still, if you look, um, just a second, now this chart, which shows all the, the matrix, all the potential outcomes, how it could be, uh, you see that uh, most, uh, it's lo it looks very unlikely that Ukrainian transit could be avoided any time before 2020. And even beyond 2020, it's very questionable. So uh, most likely it will be a combination of uh, Ukrainian route, uh, maybe one uh, a string of Turkish stream, maybe one string uh, of Nord Stream, maybe no new pipelines if Turkey and European Union will strongly oppose, which could be the case we saw already uh, with the South Stream that European Union can really block uh, the project development. Uh, but of course, Russia has a very strong, again, geopolitically driven desire to bypass Ukraine. It will do everything it can to, uh, to promote these bypassing routes, but uh, the uncertainty here is very high. And uh, just to finish with, uh, once again, I want to show you this, how to say, duality of the current situation. Um, you know, uh, a year ago, I was also here in Washington and we were discussing uh, what is the future of the Russian economy, of the Russian oil and gas sector, and there were like two positions. So some people were saying, it's going to collapse. It's just no way, it's not sustainable, it's going to collapse, so the, other, the others Optimists were saying, no problem, Russia can break through as it did all the time before, so it will uh, mobilize, it will accumulate all the resources, and it will compete, and um, everything will be fine. So uh, I would say my personal impression is that both are right and both are wrong. So from one hand, Russia indeed has tremendous resilience and all these oil and gas industries which were created in the Soviet time, when, which then survived through much worse crisis in 1990s with a 40% drop of GDP compared to 4% now, and with the 50% drop of the industrial output, and with 10 years of non-payments, non-investing, and so on. So it really, it has this huge reserve, and it knows how to survive. But from the other hand, uh, this stagnation in which we are now getting in, and this extremely unfavorable environment, it's definitely it cannot be ignored, it will definitely affect the industry. And assuming also all these institutional inefficiencies which were accumulated during the last 10 years, the ability of the industry to adapt, to react, to find uh, some creative ways how to survive, it is less than it was in 1990s, that's my uh, expectation. But it has still a lot of low cost reserves. 
So if you look uh, here, I show the chart for uh, gas. Uh, there is a very similar chart for oil that Russian gas is still extremely competitive if Russia will decide to compete on price just not uh, trying to protect any longer oil indexation but go uh, on gas on gas competition, it has huge reserves to actually undermine all the new uh, LNG producers. And similarly with oil, yeah, Saudis and other Gulf producers, they have lower costs, but after that, it's only Russia, the next low cost producer. And as long as um, maybe until 2020, 2023, uh, there is still uh, the major part of oil and gas pr production. It will come from, the, from these old fields, which have been already depreciated with the old infrastructure, which again, you need just to cover operational expenditures to keep oil and gas flowing. So that gives also huge advantage in this competition and in this uh, new like world uh, energy market redivision, which most likely we are now uh, going to observe. So um, I think I'll stop on that and uh, then move to your questions, which would help to clarify some other issues which I didn't touch upon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for this most comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, we have just short of half an hour uh, uh, for questions. Uh, but uh, while you're thinking about your questions, maybe I can ask you a couple uh, of clarifying questions. Uh, uh, one is, you talked about the trillion rubles that magically showed up on Rosneft's balance sheet. So if my calculation is right, that's about $15.5 billion. Um, uh, is that just prepayment? for? So, so it's really future revenue discounted with some cost of capital, uh, that, that you're getting the money now, but you won't have that same revenue down the road sometime in the future. I just want to make sure that I un, un, un understood that. If memory serves, uh, during Russia's WTO accession negotiations, there was a condition of moving towards net back equivalency uh, gas pricing. Uh, uh, it sounds like you're saying that that gas, domestic gas price reform is delayed indefinitely. It, it, and, and if that were, if that's true, does Russia not expose itself to um, WTO cases for export subsidies? Um, is that a risk uh, or is that not a, a relevant factor? Uh, so, first of all, about Rosneft, yeah, you are right. Uh, it's still, I mean, it's not explicitly announced that these uh, magic trillion rubles are prepayment, so we can just guess. Uh, CNPC doesn't confirm, Rosneft doesn't confirm, so, but where else it could come from? That's a legitimate question. Most likely, uh, that's it. Uh, and it's not the first prepayment, I would say. So, frankly speaking, it looks more and more like uh, the money, uh, the oil is sold, uh, the uh, money are received, and mainly they are already spent. <laughs> so, uh, when we are talking about growing Russia's dependence on China, that's probably the most important factor, just corporate dependence of Rosneft on CNPC. That's really increasing, and uh, even without one core deal, it's already becoming critical. But in the longer term, in five, ten years, uh, that will be much more painful because supplying oil already without receiving any money, that will, could be problematic. Concerning the WTO um, issue on netback pricing, you know, the wording there by that time was very tricky. Uh, it was uh, showing the exact numbers, like $60 per thousand cubic meters, uh, $40 per thousand cubic meters. Russia has already uh, fulfilled these obligations. It was not saying netback parity. Okay, okay. That's good. very good. Um, Julia? Uh, if if uh, 
not everyone knows each other, so if you could introduce yourself uh, uh, before you ask a question, that would be helpful. Thank you, Tatiana. That was great. Uh, Julia Nane, Energy Ventures, LLC. My question is following up on what Ed was talking about. Do you know how much um, oil Rosneft is actually sending to China through the Kazakhstan-China pipeline? Oh, I cannot say now. I have to check. I just don't remember, frankly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And, and why we added? What's the status of uh, Expo expansion, and, and what uh, what what might be the date? That's a, that's a separate, fascinating story. I mean, Rosneft knows how to build good good relationship with the counterparties. Uh, it has a tremendous conflict not only with Gazprom but also with Transneft. So at the moment, Transneft uh, is uh, officially announcing that it is. Um, uh, the project is under discussion, but so far uh, no uh, decisions are made and, uh, of course, no investments are made. Uh, Ro uh, Transneft has a long uh, dispute with Rosneft concerning the CSPO expansion and tariffs and many, many other things. Uh, so I think uh, it's, like, it's on the agenda, but there are no physical moves mm -hmm. with it. And uh, I think it will need a separate uh, high-level uh, decision to start to, 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 to evolve somehow. Someone will have to arbiter. Yeah, that. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Sally Kornfeld, uh, Director for International Oil and Gas at the Department of Energy. Um, so, fabulous presentation, very meaty. but. I was wondering if you had thought that rather than it being a negative factor that Russian domestic demand is low because of poor economics um, internally, that actually that's a blessing. And the reason I'm saying that is that with low domestic prices that, um, for example, in the Middle East there are many producers that wish that they were not having increased demand because they're not able to export as much and they have low domestic prices in their countries. So in fact, if Russian demand was higher, then exports would have to be lower and the companies would have less uh, profitability than they do now, even with the low prices internationally. I was wondering what you, what you thought of that. It depends on the reason why demand is low, right? Well, uh, it's, uh, um, so look, uh, um, for the oil market, uh, that's true. With the higher domestic demand, you have less uh, left for exports, but oil prices are not regulated. In fact, uh, petroleum products prices in Russia are higher than in the US. So it's not a problem. It's the problem with the gas market. And here, even if you have more gas available for exports, you cannot export it because nobody wants it. Yeah, so you cannot, there is no, no this interplay. And domestic market, what was happening during the last uh, uh, several years uh, at the domestic gas market was actually very strong price growth. So you see, uh, and they were actually already uh, by 2013, 2014, they were uh, above 100 uh, US dollars per thousand cubic meters. So they were comparable to the US uh, 100 hub prices. Yeah, and so uh, the uh, companies working on this market, namely Gazprom, Rosneft, and Novatek, were really having already quite good profits. It became a profitable business for the first time ever in the Russian gas industry. And that's the reason why they were investing so hardly. It was working, it was good. And suddenly after they've made all these investments, they find out that it's no longer that attractive and it's no longer expanding. So, uh, yeah, uh, with the low gas prices, it's not uh, interesting uh, to have expanding domestic demand. It's not a bless at all. I completely agree with you. Uh, but everybody 
was thinking about higher prices and then that could be good. But again, this was all uh, false expectations which didn't turn uh, out to be true. But what is really important and really uh, probably the most negative outcome of all this mess is that all positive processes in energy saving, new technologies implementation, and all this modernization of the energy sector, which were uh, starting more or less with the high growth rates, they are now to be forgotten for a very long period of time. Energy efficiency seems to be the last thing companies will invest in. So uh, with the low gas prices, it makes absolutely no sense to, to invest in the gas saving and uh, uh, any um, energy efficiency measures. So in this respect, Russia finds itself again in the state where, which it had uh, in the beginning of this century, which huge energy intensity and absolutely no ways how to reduce it, which is bad not just for Russia, but also for the world in terms of emissions and wastage and all these sort of things. Gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Sorry we couldn't offer you a more pleasant day to visit Washington. My name is Doug Samuelson. I'm president and chief scientist of Infologics Incorporated, a small consulting company here in the area. Now that Russia has established a military presence in Syria and the mood of the world toward Daesh, ISIL, ISIL whatever you call them, seems to be quite hostile, might Russia decide to interdict the flow of oil from those Iraqi oil fields through the Turkish pipelines to European markets that reportedly constitute a large portion of ISIL's revenue. And if you think that might happen, what do you think some of the consequences might be? Oh, that's an interesting question, but frankly, I'm such a bad specialist in political science and especially in understanding what could happen in the Middle East. At least the last two years have shown that I'm completely wrong <laughs> in all my expectations. I couldn't predict a, even a fraction of what has <laughs> happened, Yeah, uh, similarly to Ukraine, frankly. So, um, I mean, um, Russia is already present in Iraq. Yeah, Luke Oil has a very good project under development and it is already sending uh, oil to Europe. So, but I can hardly imagine in this extremely turbulent military environment and in this extremely uh, unfavorable geopolitical environment, especially like Russia-Turkish current relationships, that, that's fantastic, uh, that Russia could really build the whole supply chain and protect it somehow. And uh, moreover, as I mentioned, it has uh, plenty of oil uh, from the Russian fields which need to be brought somehow to Europe and sold in Europe. So what would be the reason to bring there also Iraqi oil? I'm not quite sure, except for th there could be some geopolitics, which I don't understand, but could be anything. Um, I'm much more thinking about Iran, frankly, and not going to Europe, but going to Asia. And you know, there are these negotiations uh, ongoing for more than a year on like um, oil in return for goods. Uh, like Russia getting some Iranian oil and then most likely sending it to China. So there are lots of speculations about it. But for me, that makes much more sense in terms of Russian external policy, energy policy, not policy policy, just energy policy, uh, to canalize this oil out of European market to the Asian market. At least that would help to protect for the next uh, three to five years uh, the positions of Russian companies uh, in Europe. For me, that would make more sense. Uh, uh, I would note that just in the last couple of days, the news is that the US Air Force is targeting uh, a tanker trucks moving uh, oil out. Uh, uh, from uh, ISO operations. We've been bombing oil facilities all along, but not tanker trucks until the last couple of days, as I understand it. Uh, General. 
Thank you. Mark Mankishak, Center for Eastern Studies, SOSW, Warsaw, Poland, here at Transatlantic Academy. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. I have uh, two concrete questions. First question concerning uh, uh, power of Siberia gas pipeline. Um, as we know, the contracts on this gas pipeline were reached with China on complete different market situation, complete different price levels, and a different uh, prognosis concerning gas demand in China. And these were substantially changed. And we know also that not all problems were resolved with the contracts, namely the financial scheme, the China credits that was not agreed. Um, and already has been some uh, declared delays with the execution of the project. Basically, my question is, uh, do you foresee a scenario uh, in which the power of Siberia will be whether seriously delayed, scaled down substantially, or it won't uh, be built at all? Um, and since you suggested that that has a, a, a crucial role for the diversification, future diversification uh, uh, for, of, of the ex gas exports from Russia towards Asia, that would be very interesting to see what's your position. And my second uh, question concerns European market, because what we could observe recently is, uh, is uh, uh, increased kind of use of open bidding and spot market uh, mm -hmm. to, to sell the Russian gas in Europe. My question to you is whether this is kind uh, will become kind of additional and rather occasional way of uh, uh, approaching the market, or we are seeing just the beginning of more substantial change in the ways Russia would, would, is active on the European market instead of, for example, long-term contracts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good questions, yeah, thank you. So, um, with the power of Siberia, yeah, you are absolutely right. The uh, deal was done at $100 per barrel oil, and at, according to our calculations, it is breaking through actually at $10, uh, approximately $10 per MBTU, to you, which is not the case uh, with the current oil prices. Uh, so, of course, it's not such a pleasant deal at the moment. The all hopes are with the oil price recovery by the period when the gas will physically start to flow. Yeah, so we have like uh, eight years before that, so which gives some relief. Um, and yes, indeed, Chinese gas demand is slowing down. It's not double digit. Last year it was like 8.7%, yeah. So, and this year probably even below that, uh, but still it is growing. And still what is important, China needs to diversify its uh, supply sources. It's like the, the continuous uh, strategy. And uh, in this respect, some Russian supplies are fitting pretty well this diversified portfolio which uh, China is creating. So I'm sure that there will be some Russian gas flowing to China. The question is where exactly it will come from. And here we are coming to the most interesting intrigue in all these uh, Eastern gas exports. We try to describe it in detail with Jim Henderson in our paper on the Russian gas export strategy. Uh, it was published in September. And so, um, the idea is that for Russia, and especially for Gazprom, it's much more attractive and favorable to propose Altai instead of power of Siberia. It's cheaper, it doesn't demand any upstream investments, it doesn't demand a gas processing plant. Part of the infrastructure <coughs> is built already, and it will help to canalize this gas bubble from the Western Siberia. So it's good from all points of view, except for the fact that China doesn't want gas in this <laughs> northwestern part, where all Turkey Turkmenian gas is actually flowing in, and then they have to transport it through the whole country. So as I've heard, uh, Chinese uh, uh, pro proposed Gazprom to build on its own the whole uh, west-east pipeline to bring this gas to, uh, to the coastal regions, which is not uh, like funny. Um, from the other hand, uh, Chinese uh, do want to diversify. So for them, uh, Chianda and Kavikta, or 
alternatively even more interesting uh, Far Eastern route, which was put on the table in September and which actually undermines the last hopes of Japanese to get some Russian gas uh, from Sakhalin. That looks uh, geopolitically for China very attractive. So there could be theoretically some changes, but uh, at the same time as China has already reported that it is constructing uh, its part of power of Siberia. So um, in order not to lose face, in order to comply with the contractual obligations, I'm afraid if, the, if, the, if these alternative deals are not done next year, Gazprom will have no other choice rather than to build this pipeline and then try to think how to live with it. So uh, yeah, and what to do with the gas processing plant, which is a separate, very expensive story. So yeah, there are many uncertainties. Uh, what, what would be the source of Far East gas? Uh, Sakhalin 1? Sakhalin 1, yeah. Okay. yeah. So they have, uh, uh, with all the expansions and also hopefully some Sakhalin 3 gas coming on stream, with all the expansions there will be approximately 15 to 20 uh, BCM of gas by 2020, uh, which could be sent either to the LNG plants or uh, to China or by pipeline to Japan. There are different options, uh, but for China, of course, that looks quite attractive. Um, Concerning your uh, question on Europe, uh, yes, indeed, uh, my strong belief is that it's already a trend, that it's not just an occasional opportunistic uh, thing. Uh, we've made uh, uh, in one of our articles a chart showing all the contractual renegotiations which Gazprom had during, since 2009 and all the price uh, revisions that it has provided. We made calculations showing that actually by mid-2015, Gazprom has already provided 25% discount on average compared to the prices in uh, price formulas, traditional price formulas, oil linked in 2008. So there, there are already very strong uh, changes in the strategy. And uh, it looks like um, this idea that uh, earlier or later, this transition to uh, sport-based uh, indexation in the long-term contracts is inevitable. It's really becoming like the mainstream for ga Gazprom as well. So, of course, officially it will not confirm it. But if you look at the calculations they are making and the projections they are making, uh, that's like already a common knowledge. And moreover, if you look at the European uh, gas market, uh, excluding Turkey, uh, it is already 70% of gas being supplied under spot indexation, not 50 as it was a couple of years ago. So uh, it, it is already the prevailing pricing mechanism. And right now it's not that necessary for Gazprom to, to give, uh, to completely switch to spot indexation because oil prices are so low that they are actually providing the same price level for the customers. But if and when the oil prices will start start to recover, I think the next round of contract revisions uh, is inevitable. And for Gazprom, as I mentioned, uh, the main task will be just to protect the market share, to protect this 30% niche. Uh, so uh, it has shown during the last two years that it can be very flexible in these negotiations and uh, finding very interesting and creative schemes, how to put it inside the framework of the oil index contracts through these rebates and uh, retroactive payments. So uh, they will do it. And moreover, this experiment with the uh, gas auctions uh, through the Nord Stream, uh, it is also a good example on how they can fit into the uh, spot uh, market reality without even going directly to the spot market. So they are creating their own quasi-spot mechanisms, uh, which worked. 
And I think uh, the, there was a statement of uh, Alexander Medvedev from uh, Gazprom saying that, yeah, we, we, we like the results of these auctions. We want to expand them. We want to bring uh, these volumes up to 10 BCM next year, which shows that they will experiment. And most importantly, it's not just about the pricing mechanism, but in the case of Nord Stream 2 uh, expansion, uh, that's also a very critical instrument uh, to uh, change the label on this gas in St. Petersburg so that you sell this gas like in St. Petersburg exchange or exactly at Gazprom export office and then it's already somebody else's gas uh, going through Nord Stream so uh, with full compliance with the European laws. So just to clarify for the for the audience, that, that means the shipper of record is now the buyer rather than the seller yep. as a way of working around the third energy package. Exactly. And things like the OPAL restriction mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. possibly, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, insightful presentation as always, Tatiana. Um, in the, over the last few weeks, we've seen in the U.S. quite a bit of pullback in Arctic exploration. Shell, and and then earlier this week, Statoil announced, and and then of course uh, in the in the Russian Arctic, there's been a, a bit of slow. Well, at least in the case of at least one American company that had a joint venture, the sanctions have had an impact. But um, so so would uh, be interested in in some of your thoughts on what is the the status and future of Russia. Uh, Arctic development. That was obviously this whole issue of Arctic development was much in the global uh, press uh, earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. um, good question. Well, um, there is already uh, quite an extensive uh, Russian uh, Arctic uh, hydrocarbon development, which is Bovanenkova, for example, onshore field uh, by uh, developed by Gazprom. Uh, the Rispri Razlomne offshore field operated by Gazprom Neft and uh, it is increasing its production and uh, I don't think that it will stop uh, at any certain moment. So there is some presence but for me it's very questionable whether uh, any other new offshore projects will take place. So they most likely um, I put high bets on the uh, Yamala Lenshi project which is also it's Arctic, it's onshore Arctic uh, at uh, Yamal most likely it's going to happen, but it doesn't need any specific technologies, so it's uh, typical conventional onshore gas uh, with no uh, uh, drilling platforms or something like that. Uh, so uh, it's like normal functioning and permafrost with thousands of piles, so that's how it works. Um, but uh, when it comes to, for example, Kara Sea development or any Barents Sea development, any offshore, uh, uh, more or less uh, deep water drilling, it's not deep water, but still offshore. Here, I would say that for me, it was always very questionable, even when oil was 110, uh, because these projects are actually breaking even at even higher prices. They are extremely technologically challenging and frankly, nobody knows uh, how to organize rescue operations in this environment, what to do with the oil spills. But I think it's not just Russian trouble, it's all, it's a problem of all Arctic projects uh, right now. Uh, my personal belief is that uh, humankind is not ready for, for these projects at the moment to do them uh, in the commercially efficient and environmentally responsible way. So. For for me, I do not see any problem with all the Arctic projects being postponed sometime uh, after 2030, 2040. Uh, they are too risky and there is plenty of oil and gas available onshore. In case of Russia, there is plenty of oil still uh, remaining in the existing reservoirs simply because of very low uh, oil recovery rates. So even if you just apply uh, the primary and secondary oil recovery uh, technologies, you can already f produce much more oil than you would find in Arctic in the next 20 years. And for me, it's always make, making much more sense, but um, of course, uh, there is a strong, strong geopolitical component showing that we are present in Arctic and developing it, and especially with all these disputes uh, concerning uh, the uh, geological resources. And there is also very huge, um, how to say, uh, 
large companies like large projects. <laughs> it's not about like taking small, uh, the rest of uh, oil which is left in the smaller reservoirs. Uh, they need frontiers. Uh, but I think uh, uh, this cycle of the global oil market development absolutely doesn't favorize ambitions. Now, the next 10 years, they will be about efficiency, cost 